that. Turn in your Bibles, James chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 13 through 18. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. And we're going to talk about wisdom. Wisdom of the world, wisdom of God. And what exactly that looks like. Now, as I, I got through working on this and going through, what I kept noticing is there is a lot of uh, echoes in James 3, especially this part of James 2. James 2 talks about how faith without works is dead. You can say something, but if you don't act it out, it does you absolutely no good. And I think you're going to see an echo of that lesson here when we talk about true wisdom and false wisdom or worldly wisdom or selfish wisdom and you talk about how uh, true wisdom is more about application and more about your treatment of others than it is just having facts or knowledge or whatever else. But as we introduce it, and you may be very familiar with this fella, uh, I'm not as familiar, but it's interesting to me. This fella here, his name is Gordon Moore. And uh, he was the founder of Intel. He worked for IBM. A lot of these computer companies, as they were just getting off the ground, and he came up with this principle. Uh, 1965, he didn't expect it to be a principle or a law. It's just something he noticed. And what he noticed was um, each year, or every few years, he noticed that the wafers for this computer stayed the same, the memory cards, but each 10 years, you could double the number of transistors that would fit on that card. And every 10 years, even with inflation, that, that card went to half its size. And so he, he got to looking at that, and as he discussed that at the different conventions, uh, it became where people began talking about that. And you've probably heard that we have... We double our information. Used to, they would say, every 100 years, we double the information that we have. Then it turned into every 50 years. By the time Dr. Moore was here, he said that every 10 years. Now, the latest idea is every 11 years, mankind, people here on Earth, double the amount of information that we have. Now, looking at that at the surface, I think there is no way. But you begin looking around, and it's amazing how different we, were, we are today than we were 10 years ago. Um, of course, I lose my phone constantly, but we got this in our pockets. And if you would have told me that a $600 phone, and yes, I'm that cheap, but I would be walking around with a six dollars or $700 phone in my pocket 15 years ago, I would have laughed at you. I mean, I had the $30 Razor Motorola, and I was complaining about that, right? But now, not only do I have it, but my kids have it in their pockets, and theirs are a whole lot more expensive than mine. But you look at this thing, it's a camera. You can watch TV and videos on it. You can talk to people all over the world. We don't have to pay for long distance like we used to, did we? Or do we? Um, it's a calculator. Remember when your second grade teacher made you actually use your fingers and your mind to do stuff because she said what was going to happen when you grew up? You're not going to have a calculator with you. Well, guess what? You do. All right. Books, Google, you can find out all sorts of information and it is all right here in this little thing. And actually, this is obsolete. It's a thing of the past. There's newer models, better models, smaller models, faster models, and it's only a matter of time till that disappears. Bring that back to medical care. The way in which we treated people 10 years ago, 20 years ago, is so different than what we see today. If you remember when we moved into this building 20 years ago, there were a lot of arrangements made because so many people were in wheelchairs. And there's still some people in wheelchairs. But nowadays, with hip replacements, knee replacements, you don't see the people in wheelchairs that you used to see. And it's fascinating what they can do medically that they weren't even able to do five years ago. Uh, you think about uh, 
the way computers work, chat GPT, if you get to play with any of this AI, if you're interested in it, it is fascinating what this stuff does. I have a friend who teaches in a university and he lets his computer or he lets his uh, software write out his study notes. It will just scan over what uh, the test is and also his class notes and it will write his class notes or write his study notes, write all sorts of stuff. Now, it's still quirky enough where you have to proofread it, but it's amazing. You don't really have to work so hard to write a book. You just give the computer an idea and the computer will go off and do it if you put the right information in there. The world is very different than what it used to be. And it's just fascinating. 90% uh, of all scientists who have ever lived are alive today. Think about that. 90% of all full-time scientists who have ever lived are alive today. And so information doubles every century, decade, now 11 months. Computers, phones, transportation, and medical field. And so it's pretty amazing to see how quick everything's rolling along. And so if you look at the ages, as you go through, we have the Iron Age, the Bronze Age. Uh, some people called it the Space Age starting in the 60s. Nowadays, most people call it the information age. And we say the information age started in 1900. A lot of historians, it's hard to see when you're that close to history, but they say it started in 1900. And the reason for that is all the differences that we know. Uh, today, the majority of people make their living by the rearranging of information. You take information, you rearrange it, you uh, process it and create this or create that or whatever else it might be. And I know in preaching, um, I came from the age and I've been through the transition. One time I had over 50,000 books in my church library. And I had Strong's Concordance, Young's Concordance, you remember those? And uh, Thayer's Analytical, you know, and, and you may know of those books, may not know of those books. Now you talk to these younger preachers, eh, they got 20 books. All right? Why do you have 20 books? Well, you don't need them. Everything is now online. And you don't have to find all those books. Now you better be reading. But many of the books that we read now are in Kindle or whatever else it may be. The, the world is just so different in this technology age. Now, if you are ever interested in science, uh, you go through... In the book of Judges, chapter 7, 22, we see the Midianites. It's the first time we start seeing about iron in the uh, Bible. That's about the beginning of the Iron Age, be around 1000 B.C. Uh, the Philistines were able to work with iron because they had come from Crete. And before that, they had come from Greece. And they had learned how to deal with iron and deal later with bronze. And we see the Israelites didn't have that power. That would be 1 Samuel 13, 9 and 10. And so it wasn't until 2 Samuel 8 where David conquered the land south of Edom. And in that area, he was able to get iron ore pits. And Israel was finally on an equal footing to fight the Philistines and fight other people. And so there you see the differences in ages as you go through Scripture. Now we live in the information age. And so much of our, our world is dominated by technology and by information, even the way we fight battles. Uh, used to, you had a sword and you had a whack on somebody. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and the further along we go, the more leisure time we get, theoretically, right? And, and with each new invention, and so that happened in Greece, where the cradle of democracy began, and has happened as we've gone along with the uh, way in which technology works. And so it's just fascinating stuff to see how we move. And so I want us to notice that and put that together as we get ready to go into James 3 and what it is we're going to cover when we look at James 3, because this is written to people in the information age. It's written, it was written to people in the first century, but it's applicable or applicable, depending on what part of the country you live in, to us. And man, we've got to know how to deal with 
information. And so James starts up here in verse 13, right? Who is wise, notice that word, Sophia in the Greek, who is wise and understanding among you? If you're wise and understanding, let, you, let him show it by his good conduct, because his works will be done in the meekness of wisdom. All right, knowledge. We've got more knowledge than we've ever, ever have had. Um, it's amazing, even at our fingertips, you can find out any knowledge which you ever had wanted to know. I, I was sitting, I think it was in my mother-in-law's house, Ruth Ann's house, last week, and I just came up with a question because I think she was on TV or something. I thought to myself, how old is Madonna? Now, how would you figure that out a while back? You'd have to look maybe in an encyclopedia. Yes, she's that old. Or you'd have to, you know, look here or there, ask somebody who knows. Nope, you pull out your phone, you type in Madonna age, right? And it doesn't go to the mother of Jesus. <laughs> it goes to the singer. I think she's 63, if I'm not mistaken. She's somewhere in the early 60s. But uh, we're just in the information age. You can find out any information that you have. But there's a danger. Romans 121. Man has learned so much that his thoughts have become futile and his foolish thoughts are darkened and he claims to be wise, but instead he's become as a fool. Later they say instead of worshiping the creator, now they worship the creature. We learn so much and know so much. We worship at the God of Sophia, of wisdom, so much that we begin to put ourselves above other folks. And sometimes that even happens in the church. Some people will say, well, you know, I have listened to this preacher or I have read this book. And they'll talk to somebody else and say, you just don't understand. You don't understand this thing which is here or there or whatever else. And so that, that knowledge just hits there. And so uh, knowledge is an accumulation of facts. And sometimes when we get enough facts, it leads to pride, leads to arrogance, and we become smarter. Uh, but the smarter is not always better, is it? We live in a world now of nuclear weapons, and more and more countries are gaining those nuclear weapons. Thankfully, the nuclear weapon's only been used twice so far, right? Nagasaki and Hiroshima. But there's a lot of places that have it and have the ability to absolutely destroy the earth with a push of a button. Is that wisdom good or is that knowledge good? It's good that it can power so much. But man, we put ourselves on a precipice of disaster, don't we? Because knowledge and that knowledge which is there. Juxtaposed to knowledge is what the Bible calls wisdom. And wisdom includes knowledge, but it's using the information you have in a proper way. Wisdom is taking the knowledge and using it in a proper way. Now, let me give you an illustration, and it may be too personal for some folks, but we're not singling out anybody because I don't know any of the information, right? We all know that you're better off if you have money at the end of the month, right? I mean, we've got budgeting 101. Don't spend money, save money, invest money. We have that knowledge, right? What about practice? Uh-oh. Sometimes there's a lot more money than there, or a lot more months than there is money. And we know what we should do, but we have our mind somewhere else or we're not really watching very well. And we don't exercise wisdom. There's, that's an, the basic example of how you can have knowledge, but you're not using wisdom with it. And what James is warning us here about, and this is one of the first books of the New Testament written, is he is saying, be careful as a Christian that you don't just accumulate knowledge without putting it into practice. It's good that you know about Jesus. It's good that you know the plan of salvation. It's good that you know the lifestyle a Christian should live, but it's much better if you take that knowledge and put it into practice. Wisdom shows your character. It shows who you really are. And it shows your talent 
as far as like how you really live. Now, look there in verses 14 through 16. And here he talks about the different ways. Now, it's interesting to me, even in the Greek, he uses wisdom in a negative way. It's the only time he's done it that I noticed in this passage. He's got the negative wisdom and positive wisdom. Notice what he says here in verse 14. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, don't boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom, that's a negative wisdom, does not descend from above, but it's earthly, sensual, demonic. For where, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. All right. There is a wisdom, an accumulation and use of facts that leads you to a very dangerous place. There are some people who will take information and they use it to exalt themselves. They'll take information and they'll use it to make themselves look better or make other people look ignorant. There are some people who will almost be demonic because they will seek so much to, to promote themselves. And James says, this wisdom is from below. It means Satan's in charge of you. It means the devil is the one who's ruling you. And so be careful that you don't use knowledge for an evil way. Be careful that you don't use your college degrees or you don't use your years of experience at the plant or you don't use your seniority of wherever it is that you work to lord over other people. Be careful of the way in which you treat people who seem to not have what you have or have the experience that you have. Now, that's the demonic earthly, sensual wisdom. On the other side is the heavenly wisdom. And what is that heavenly wisdom that's from above? It's taking the knowledge you have and using it to act like a Christian. It's taking the knowledge that you have, working with that information so that you can serve your neighbor and serve him well in a way in which he should go. It's so important for us to notice. And so as we look at that, we're going to look, because what James does is he uses eight different terms, and we'll look at them two at a time, eight different terms, that is the wisdom from above, and what that wisdom from above looks like. That wisdom from above is first pure, it's peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, it's full of mercy and good fruits, it's without partiality and without hypocrisy. Okay? Yes, sir, Matt? A lot of times in the past, at least in my understanding, and even in the church, we were taught that wisdom comes from experience. And it does, earthly wisdom. But if I understand what James is saying, first of all, you've got to ask, a Christian can be a great Christian for 50 years and depend on his earthly knowledge and experience to have wisdom. That's not what he's talking about. Right, he right. Says, Right. You going back to James chapter one, talking about asking God. Yes, ma'am, Debbie. Yeah, yeah. In a sense, it is discernment. Discernment's a good word to use there. Yeah, wisdom is more than the accumulation of knowledge. It's using God, asking God to organize that information in a way that does the church good. Primarily, the church, I think, is what we're going to see in these eight words, eight phrases but also ourselves. It's a proper use of knowledge. Using knowledge in the right way. Right, yeah. It, earthly wisdom is not going to get you where you need to be on that subject at all. That's right. Absolutely. And so here are these eight things. The very first thing, and this is interesting, I think, that he starts off with this one, pure. We are to be pure. Okay, uh, 1 John 3, 3 tells us that God is pure in the way in which he goes. What does it mean to be pure as you look at this passage? I, I think it's good to look over Matthew 23, 25 through 26. That's the woe passage, right? 
is right after Jesus is about to leave the temple and he is pronouncing his curse upon the nation of Israel. Matthew 23, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, to the scribes, and he says, you're nothing more than a whitewashed tomb. Outside you look beautiful, you look like a monument, your marble is polished, but you look inside that tomb, dead men's bones. It is a grotesque thing to notice. He said, you're like a dish. You pick up a dish and you think, man, that thing looks clean. And then you start to pour something in it and you look inside and the inside is nasty. And if you've already taken a drink, you spit it out because it's so bad. Jesus says that's how the people were in that day. And he says because of that, the nation of Israel is going to come to an end. He, is, he said himself, he's never coming back to the temple. That's 24, 1 through 3 or 1 through 4 of Matthew. But there you see an illustration of what it means to be impure. As Christians, it's not enough to cleanse the outside if we don't cleanse the inside. And it's necessary for us to keep ourselves clean in the eyes of God. Now, when I say keep ourselves clean, that looks like somebody preaching about good works and moral goodness. And Maybe a little bit, but that's not how we get clean. To get clean, you have to be washed in the blood. Acts twenty two sixteen, Saul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That baptism will clothe us, Galatians three twenty seven. That baptism will join us to the church, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. That baptism will save us, 1 Peter 3, 21. The way you're made to be pure is that you are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now, once we become Christians, we have to be continually washed because we sometimes go right back to the mud after we've been cleansed. And so 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 it says, as we walk in that light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. It keeps us to be pure. And so the very first thing you need to do, if you are to have wisdom, is to be a person who lives a Christian life, washed in the blood of Jesus, living faithfully towards God, having your Christianity be inside as well as outside. And that's so necessary for us to have. Okay? Second of the eight, we are to be peaceable. Okay? Peaceable. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Now, he'll bring this up here in a little bit, but worldly wisdom brings strife. That's how you see what worldly wisdom is. Godly wisdom brings peace. Now, there's sometimes as Christians, we need to get mad and we don't enough. And there's sometimes as Christians, there has to be a sharp dispute. We have to get angry, as Paul did in Galatians 2. But for the most part, the reason we get angry is we're trying to promote peace within the Lord's church. As a Christian, you need to be somebody who promotes peace. Now, we're talking about the congregation. Yes. But we're also talking about your family. And we're also talking about where you are at work. And where you are at school. And we're even talking about where you are individually. Peacemaker, even, yes, with yourself. Worldly wisdom brings strife. When you get knowledge, you learn more and you learn more and you begin to hold it over to other people. When you have knowledge, a lot of times, you ever met somebody who loves to debate religious facts? They're always looking for an argument. And sometimes that's to make themselves look smart. Sometimes it's just because they're persnickety, right? Sometimes they're just that way. Godly wisdom brings forth peace. And to have peace, you've got to have a loving heart. You've got to love people if you're going to be a church of peace. It's not enough just to want peace. You've got to love people enough to promote it and to promote it one with another. Okay, And we'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a little bit. Next, this wisdom, godly wisdom, is gentle. Now, that word in the Greek 
actually is a little bit different than how I would have translated it. Of course, those guys are a whole lot smarter than I am. <laughs> Man, Greek was not pleasant for me at all. But this word for gentle is used in the Old Testament, in the Septuagint translation, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, to describe God. And let me show you how it's used to describe God. God has not judged us yet, has he? Now, would he have reason to? Guess what? You've sinned in your life. And a lot of times, if we were God, we would, once somebody sinned, give up on them, zap them, send them to hell forever. God allows some really evil people in this world to still be here. And sometimes we wonder, why? Why, God, are you so patient? He's gentle. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Remember what that passage says? The Lord doesn't want anybody to perish, but He's long-suffering. And that's the reason why the Lord has not come back yet. He's waiting for just a few more people to repent. And so that's a word used of God talking about His long-suffering nature, talking about His nature in which He is patient toward us. That's got to describe us. And that's what I mean when I talk about that word gentle. Okay? Simple illustrations. First time you rode a bike, guess what you did? Unless you're a very rare person, you fell off that bike. Now, if you're going to learn how to ride that bike, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to get back up on it, aren't you? You're going to have to hop right back up on it. You ever seen somebody who played the violin for the very first time? It'll make you even think your cat sounds good, right? Oh, it's painful. They have to practice, and they have to practice, and they have to practice until finally it begins to sound decent. Anything you do that's worth doing takes a while to become an expert. And you've got to be patient with yourself and with others until we get there. And so what this word gentle is talking about is having that attitude toward other people. We've got to give one another grace. We've got to give one another room to grow, room to mature, room to become what God wants them to be. Now, a lot of times somebody comes up out of that water we expect them to act like somebody who was baptized 40 years ago and does not miss a single church service. Are they going to be imbued with all the experience and knowledge immediately when, they're, when they've obeyed the gospel? No. God calls them babes in Christ, doesn't he? We've got to be gentle and allow people space and room to go. Uh, one of the uh, guys who... Uh, I, when I was reading different definitions of it, and I don't remember exactly which commentary it was, but he said this idea of gentleness means to lean toward forgiveness. When somebody wrongs you, you look for any reason possible that you can forgive them. You try to impugn, impugn motives to them to try to figure out how to forgive. That's what that wisdom, godly wisdom, really is. That's where it shows up. Now, Related to that, submissive. What's it mean to be submissive? Not weak, but it means more so to not be stubborn. One of the commentaries I was reading says to be submissive means to be um, approachable. It means that you don't have to win every single argument. An older preacher one time was speaking at a preaching school, and one of the things he said is you've got to learn, if you want to stay located long anywhere, that there's some battles that you just don't bother fighting. He said, now you stay faithful to the Word of God. You stay faithful in matters of worship and in matters of doctrine. But there's sometimes the battle's not worth fighting because the people aren't too important who are fighting in it. And you don't want to wound anybody. And so you learn to be submissive that there's times that you don't fight. There's times that you just go on and look for a time which is more important. Be submissive one to 
another. Closely related, merciful. This means to be compassionate to those who are hurting, even if, no, be compassionate to those who are hurting, especially if they don't deserve it. To want what's best for other people, even if they don't deserve it. To be kind to other people, even when it's hard to be kind. We are to love all people, right? But think about this. The harder that someone is to love, the more they need to be loved. The more difficult it is for you to love a person, actually the more love that person needs to have shown to them. There's sometimes people will act a certain way, will have a certain reputation and such, and everybody already has in their mind, that's how that person is. But if you take that person in, if you love them, if you take care of them, if you listen to them, it's amazing the change that person may have. It's amazing to see there. Now, this next word looks a little different in our list, doesn't it? Merciful, submissive, okay. Fruitful. What's it mean to be fruitful? It means to show your faith. You can have all the wisdom of the world, but if it doesn't show up in your Christian living, it is worthless. It's worse than worthless because you're judged by what you know. Great example of that, Luke 10 and verse 37. A man's walking down the street in the road to Jericho. He's waylaid by some robbers, left for dead. The priest comes by. The priest has got the first five books of the Old Testament memorized. He leads the people in worship. This is a super-duper religious man, but he's busy, and he keeps walking. Avoids eye contact. Levite comes by, another religious man. He keeps walking. Their religion did not have fruit. A Samaritan, someone who was not even in God's kingdom, saw this man hurting, took care of him, spent up to six months of wages, depending on how you define that money, brought him to the hotel, made sure he was taken care of. Who was this man's neighbor? Who was the man that showed this mercy that was here? Who was this man who was fruitful? It was a Samaritan. Do you show fruit in your Christianity? It's not enough to have the 100 verses memorized that we were talking about earlier. It's not enough to be able to quote the plan of salvation and to be able to tell every denominational person what it is about their church that's right and wrong if you don't show love to other people, if you don't show kindness to other people, if your religion, your faith in God, does not show to other people. And so, let's keep going with this. Impartial. Impartial. Well, I love people who love me. I'm nice to people who are nice to me. Is that the way Jesus was? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Thief on the cross who had been hurling insults just a few hours earlier, minutes earlier. Jesus told him when he repented, you'll be with me in paradise. It's easy to love good people. Christianity loves bad people. It's easy to love people who are nice to you. Christianity loves people who are not nice to you. It's not racist, it's not classist, it is kind to all people, okay? And sincere. To be sincere means to not be a hypocrite. See, we're going right back to where we were in the beginning, aren't we? We're not a hypocrite. We're honest about our faith. We don't have hidden names. We're not being a good Christian just so we get power, just so people can see our good works. We're a Christian because we want to look like God. We have the knowledge and we're putting it into practice to look more and more like Jesus every single day. All right, we close with chapter 3 and verse 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now you go back to the very beginning and you talk about, man, all the ways in which we've advanced all the ways in which we've improved. You remember back 
couple decades ago, a car goes 100,000 miles. That car is about done, right? Now we get 100,000 miles. Man, we got like six more years in payments. No, not really. You know, that car is just getting broken in, right? We talked about computers and how different computers are. We've talked about health and how our health is so different than it was just a generation ago. We talked earlier about Greece and the finding of silver and the different things and how that gave people more leisure time. Right now we got more leisure time than we've ever had. How do you use it? How do you use every moment that God has given to you? Information is good, but using that time profitably is better. Wisdom is greater because, as Matt said, it's given by God. God gives us the wisdom. And so the question is, how tonight are you using these blessings that God's given to you? Some of us in here have been in a Bible class for many, many, many years. You remember back in the days when uh, J. Lockhart, the scholar that he is. You remember Jim Phillips and all the things he used to know, right? You remember Gene Gilliland, and you go back and look at all these preachers and all the knowledge which they've had, and you've listened to hours and hours and hours and hours of them. It's good to hear these guys. It's good to know stuff, but are you putting it into practice? Can people see that you've learned all these things when you're at work, when you're at home, when you're around whoever it is that you happen to be around? All right. I've had a lot of people tell me they've read the book of James. They've, they've gotten through those 108 verses, and they have made it, and I'm proud of you. This is good stuff. Let's look at some other homework which we got for the week. I want us to, and you don't have to count your many blessings, name them one by one. You don't even have to write it on a sheet of paper. But over this next week, when you lay down in bed or when you get up in the morning and you have your devotional period, drinking coffee or whatever it is you drink, think about the blessings God's given you. Whether it be money, whether it be health, whether it be stuff, whether it be relationships. And as you think about those blessings, think about how each one of those applies to what you do in your Christian life. How are you using God's blessings to bless other people? Secondly, connected to that, as we talk about being gentle, long-suffering, and patient, over this next week, when you look at the attitudes which you have towards people, oh, he makes me so mad. When you look at other people, look at your attitude. Do you feel superior to them? Do you serve them? Do you love them? Ask yourself over this next week when you look at relationships and those sort of things. 